Doesn't it seem weird to be saying Merry Christmas already? Uh, I don't know. It just doesn't for this year for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, my wife, Vicki, usually wants to decorate the house like the end of August is generally what she wants to do. And I'm, I'm generally saying, no, wait, 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 wait. And it seemed like everything rushed on us this year. And uh, finally, last week, she got it decorated. She said, Brian, I'm just having a hard time getting into the Christmas spirit. So uh, I don't know why, but we want you to get in the Christmas spirit as we, uh, as we unwrap uh, Jesus in the series that we're going to be talking about the next few weeks. Let me pause, though, before I begin the message and tell you that I bring you greetings from uh, Iglesia. Bautista Biblica de Linda Vista, the Bible Baptist Church of Linda Vista. Last Sunday, Pastor Jose and I were down in Mexico City, and I appreciate your prayers for us. Uh, the first church that I started celebrated its 25th anniversary this last week, and it was great to be back with them and to see people that I hadn't seen for some 15 and 20 years, and to see how that God has blessed the church, even though it's gone through unbelievable struggles recently, God is blessed, but it it was great to take Pastor Jose there. He'd never been to Mexico City before, and so trying to adapt him to the culture, we put all the food in front of him for him to eat it. You know, the good stuff, uh, you know, chilaquiles and barbacoa. How many people like Mexican food? All right, we need to have a Mexican night or something like that. Chilaquiles and barbacoa. But then we tried to put in front of him even the, you know, the stuff that's not real fun to eat. Tacos de cachete, which are you know, tacos from the side of the face. And in Mexico, they eat tacos de nervios and tacos de ojos, you know, tacos of nerves and eyes. And I just couldn't get him to eat that stuff. I couldn't figure out why. He wasn't, he wasn't into it at all. But uh, last Sunday, we had a great anniversary celebration, and I appreciate your prayers. was able to preach over the weekend. was able to see Claudio Jimenez, our missionary to Argentina, who was there as well, and he sends greetings to our church. On Monday and Tuesday, Jose and I stayed over because I wanted him to see some of the sights and sounds of Mexico City. And so on Monday, we traveled to the pyramids of Teotihuacan. Anybody, I don't know if anybody's been there. You've probably heard about the pyramids of Teotihuacan, Pyramid of the Sun, Pyramid of the Moon and all of that kind of stuff. And I want you to know, you can be very proud of Pastor Jose because he climbed all the way to the top of the Pyramid of the Sun. Absolutely fantastic. I stood on the ground and prayed for him as he went up, but, but, but he climbed all the way to the top. I've climbed it many times before. But, um, and uh, then we were able to see the Basilica and uh, downtown Mexico City. It was a great trip. And we appreciate so much your prayers and uh, what a blessing it is for us to be able to go in and minister to churches like that. And uh, the work in Mexico City is difficult. And uh, we need to really uh, keep them in prayer. But thank you so much for allowing us to go. I appreciate Mark uh, filling the pulpit in my, in my absence. And Thomas did a great job on Thanksgiving Day. We haven't said much about that as we fed uh, some 200 people. So a lot of cool things are happening here at Hollywood Community Church. I do want to ask you to pray uh, very seriously for one of our families today, David and Linda Earl. Most of you know David and Linda Earl. Um, yesterday morning, their 20-year-old son, Jonathan, tragically passed away. Uh, completely unexpected. And um, so uh, please be praying for David and Linda today. We don't know anything yet about funeral arrangements or anything like that, but as soon as we know something, uh, we'll pass it on to you uh, so you can be praying for them during this very difficult time. Well, it's great to be back home. I miss you when I'm away. Um, I really do. And uh, we brag on all that God is doing in our church. As I stood before the church last Sunday there in Mexico City, I was able to tell them all of the neat things that God is doing here at Hollywood Community Church. And, and uh, you are a part of that. Well, today we begin a brand new series that we're calling very simply Unwrapping Jesus. So as we begin, though, let me, let me ask you a question. How, how do you unwrap a gift? You know, you know, there's several ways to unwrap a gift. And even in our family, it seems like um, all of us seem to do it differently. Uh, for, for example, maybe you like this. Maybe you're one of the people that are what I call the paper savers, when you open a gift, you know, you, you, you open it up and you're so careful, you don't want to tear anything because you might be able to use that paper next year again. 
Anybody here a paper saver unwrapper? And so you can use that paper year after year after year, all right? Um, then we have in our family, the, the people, and I'm not going to name any names, not our immediate family, but our extended family, we have, we have the people who drag out opening their gifts forever. I don't know whether you do it. We kind of do it taking turns. And so, okay, Uncle Pete, you're going to open your gift. And everybody watches Uncle Pete open his gift. And then Aunt Kimmy, you're going to open your gift. And everybody's excited. And uh, Uncle Pete, uh, that is his name. I'm not protecting the innocent. That is Uncle Pete, starts to open his gift. And everybody wants to get to their gift, and Peter starts to open his, and then he stops and says, do you remember the gifts that we got last year? And, and, and he just carries on a conversation, and then we're like, come on, Pete, open the gift. And so he opens the gift a little bit, and then he stops, and he says something else, and you just get to the place where you're like, open the gift, Pete. Open the gift. Anybody have somebody like that in your family? All right, it just like takes them forever to open their gifts. And then there's somebody like me. You know, you hand me my gift, and here's the way I'm opening it. I'm into it. I mean, it doesn't take me 30 seconds. I tear open the gift, and I'm into it. Don't save the paper. Don't save the box. Let's just get to the gift as, as fast as we possibly can. Well, the idea of unwrapping the gift is what the... the I know a lot of people spend a lot of time wrapping it, and my wife does, and, and I try when I buy her gifts to wrap them carefully, even though I still can't. You know, whenever you fold those over, it's really tough. I mean, any guys with me on that? I mean, it's really tough to fold that over, and so I just kind of end up just tucking it under and putting a bunch of tape over it, and, and then just putting a bunch of bows all over it, you know, just to try to make it, you know, look as presentable as possible. But, but the idea of opening a present, the goal is not to admire the wrapping paper. The goal, very simply, is what? To discover what is on the inside of the package. Now, I've opened up gifts like you probably have that they spent more money on the outside of the package than they did on the inside of the package. You know, you look at the gift and it's eloquently wrapped and you think, oh my word, what did this person give me? They've spent a lot of time, a lot of money on the wrapping and you open it up and you think, oh my word, the wrapping paper was worth more than what's inside the gift, all right? Uh, the goal is not the wrapping. The goal is to find out what is on the inside of the package. As beautiful as the package may be on the outside, it's what's on the inside that really counts. Well, as I mentioned today, we begin a series that we're simply calling Unwrapping Jesus. The, the goal of these messages is not simply to tell the Christmas story, but to unwrap the story of Christ's birth. For us to discover the, the beauty, the, the value, and the magnificence of the gift that has been given to us through the person of Jesus Christ. By the way, he is the most precious gift that you will ever receive. He is the most valuable gift that you will ever receive. He is the most significant gift that you will ever receive. So, so in the next few weeks, we want to look at five attributes or, or five divine characteristics of Jesus, of God, that are found in the Christmas story. So, so you saw them on, on the slide presentation just a few moments ago, but we're going to see the fact that, that he, God, is redemptive. That, that's the topic today. Next week, we're going to see that God is omnipresent. He is always with us. It doesn't matter who we are or, or what we're going through, what stage of life we're in. God is always with us. We're going to see the fact that he is worthy. We saw in our last series that he was worthy of worship, but, but, but now we're going to study the fact that he is he's worthy of our attention. He's worthy of our faith. He, he is worthy of us pursuing him. On well, Christmas Eve, we're going to see the fact that he is humble. He, he became one of us. And then the last message of the year, Thomas is going to preach on the fact that he is glorious. What does it mean that he is glorious? How should you and I respond when the glory of God 
shows up. And we'll study Jesus as he appeared to the shepherds there on that Judean hillside. And we'll study how the shepherds responded to the glory of God. Well, today we focus on God's ability to redeem. Uh, God's ability to deliver. God's ability to save. Now, our text is really small today. I know sometimes we have the habit of taking long text, but our, our text today is, is small. It's just one verse. Yet it's one verse that is filled with truth. A verse that contains the purpose of Christ's coming and the message of the gospel in just a few short words. So open your Bibles, if you have it, to Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to look at one verse, one small verse today, In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. Matthew 1 21. The angel appears to Joseph. And she says this to Joseph. She says, she, speaking of Mary, Mary will bear a son. And you will call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Would you read that together with me today? We have it up on the screen, so... We can read it in unison today. Uh, Matthew 121, read it with me. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, we're going to pray in a moment, but, but in our text, we find that Mary is expecting a child, and Joseph is not happy about it. Now, 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 you can understand why. Imagine if your fiancé, man, came to you, and your fiancé told you, hey, I'm pregnant, and you knew that you weren't the dad. <laughs> How happy would you be about that? And then she comes up with this story where she says, hey, but I don't want you to worry. I haven't been unfaithful to you. The child that I'm carrying has been conceived by God. The child that I'm carrying has been been conceived by the Holy Spirit. I'm sure Joseph's thought was, yeah, right. Couldn't you have come up with a better excuse than that? I mean, you and I can relate to uh, Joseph's response. So, so, So here in Matthew 1, we find that Joseph is struggling. He's struggling with with the news that Mary has given to him, and he's struggling with how he should respond. He's thinking about divorcing her. And you say, Brian, they hadn't got married yet. But but in, in New Testament times, once you were engaged, in order to break off the engagement, you had to go through a legal divorce. And so Joseph was thinking about divorcing her, just, just laying her aside and yet doing it in a way that wouldn't embarrass her. When all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph. I want to read our text one more time, but this time I want to add verse 20 so that we understand the context. But as he considered these things, as Joseph considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And then the verse we saw, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Well, here Joseph receives a little bit more information. And the angel tells Joseph not only what the name of the child would be, he would be called Jesus, but also that this child would live up to his name because this child would save his people, would save us from our sins. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you so much for the privilege that we have to meet together this morning. Lord, you're so good to us. Today, Lord, we pray for David and Linda Earle. I pray that you would minister to them in a way that only you can. Father, I pray that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, would rule their hearts and their minds. And Lord, I pray that you would love on them this morning. Help us to love on them. And Lord, I pray that today you would help us to see that, that 
you alone are capable of delivering us from the present evils of this world. But not only that, help us to realize that you are fully capable of delivering us, of redeeming us from the root cause of that evil, the sin that dwells in the heart of each and every one of us. Help us to understand today that you are a redemptive God, that you desire to redeem, to liberate, to save, and to deliver. And Lord, help us to embrace that truth, to accept that truth. And I pray that the power of your redeeming love, your redeeming grace, would be evident in our lives. We thank you for what you're going to do in our heart and lives today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The message very simply says this, that God is redemptive. So I ask you this morning, what, what does that mean? Uh, what does it mean theologically? And more importantly, what does that mean practically for you and for me? Let's, let's begin with a definition. I've put a definition in your outlines today. I've defined def, uh, redemptive this way. God is the one who saves his people from danger and destruction. We can talk about in our personal lives. We can talk about uh, as a nation. God is the one who saves his people from danger and destruction. I also said that redemption involves deliverance from bondage based on the payment of a price by a redeemer. So, so it doesn't just mean that we're delivered from bondage, but it means even spiritually that God as the Redeemer came and paid the price so that we might be freed, so that we might be liberated, so that we might be rescued from our own sins. So this morning I'd like for us to take just a few moments and, and to flesh that out. What does that mean? What does that mean for the nation of Israel? What does it mean for us today? What does it mean in the verse that we read just a few moments ago? I would remind you that God's desire to deliver did not begin with Jesus. Sometimes we sit back and think all of a sudden in the Old Testament God was this really mean God. And all of a sudden we get to the New Testament and God has this personality transformation. And now all of a sudden he's become loving and compassionate. And this God who was vindictive in the Old Testament is now redemptive in the New Testament. But that's simply not the case. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever and God was just as redemptive in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, throughout the entire Old Testament, we find God coming to the rescue of his people. His people, Israel, mostly because of their dumb and sinful mistakes, find themselves over and over and over again in trouble. And they need God to rescue them. They need God to deliver them. Can anybody relate to the Israelites today? All right, there's a couple honest of us here. I can. I mean, it seems like I'm always doing the dumbest things. It seems like I desperately need God's grace in my life over and over and over again because I blow it, I make mistakes. And yet God, in his faithfulness, does what? He comes to my rescue. And he comes to your rescue. We see that with the nation of Israel. And so the very first point that I put in my outline that you have in front of you today is this. In the Old Testament, God delivered his people from their enemies. Now catch that. Let's wrap our, our minds and hearts around that. In the Old Testament, God delivered his people from their enemies. And we could have pulled probably 50 different stories from the Old Testament to prove that point, but I want to use one this morning. And so put your finger here in Matthew chapter 1 and go back with me all the way to the book of Exodus, all the way to the beginning of the book of Exodus, the second chapter in the Bible. And today I kind of want to give just an overview of the book of Exodus to demonstrate God's desire to deliver us. Now, most of you know the story. Most of you probably grew up in church and you heard the story of Israel's rescue and Israel's redemption. If you have a church background, you've heard it, but um, let me catch you up on it quickly. And if you've never heard it before, let me, let me kind of tell the story as quickly as possible. The Israelites, God's chosen people, find themselves in Egypt. 
Egypt. Now, now, now you remember, we could go even back further in the book of Genesis. Joseph, one of their forefathers, had been sold into slavery. Remember, Joseph's brothers didn't like him. He had, you know, he had the, on the colorful coat, and they thought that he was the family favorite, and so they were jealous, and so they sold their brothers to this Egyptian caravan that was coming through, and Joseph was sold into slavery, ends up in Potiphar's house, a slave of Potiphar, and you know the story, Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, and Joseph ends up in prison for years and years, but God, through his sovereignty, and God, through his miraculous hand, and raises Joseph up from a prisoner in an Egyptian prison to be in second in command over all of Egypt. And when God sends a famine over Egypt, it's Joseph that God uses not only to rescue the Egyptians, but it's Joseph that God uses to rescue the Israelites as well because Joseph sends for Isaac and the rest of his family and he brings them to Egypt. Well, several years have passed. Much has transpired. Joseph has passed away, and the Israelites still find themselves in Egypt. In Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 12, I'll put it up on the screen. You can look at it in the Bible. It simply says this, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. So here's the Israelites living within the land of Egypt, and the Israelites are growing at a faster pace than the Egyptians. So much so that the Egyptians are getting scared because they're thinking, man, these people are going to what? They're going to overwhelm us, is the idea. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, what will they do? Why, they'll join our enemies, and they'll fight against us, and they'll escape from our land, and we'll lose them. So, so here's what let's do. Let's set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. And so the Israelites were used by Pharaoh to build store cities. If you know much about Egyptian history, it was the Israelites that helped build the store cities of Pithom and, and Ramses that we hear so much about but the more the Israelites worked, the more they were oppressed by the Egyptians. The more they multiplied, the more the text says that they spread abroad. And I want to pause there for a second because there's some great truths that we can pull out and we can apply to our lives. I want you to see today, note, I want you to notice that difficulty, hardship, and pain should not surprise us. Let me pause for a second, because sometimes we have this erroneous concept, okay, I've trusted Jesus as my personal Savior, so from this point forward, no more problems, no more difficulties. Everything is going to work out fine. Well, here in this passage, we find God's beloved people, his chosen people, who are described as the apple of God's I, we find his people suffering. Uh, those loved by God are being treated, the word that is used in the passage is they're being treated shrewdly. In other words, what? They're not being treated very well. Now, you might be here this morning and you say, I can relate to that. <laughs> There's been times in my life where I've been treated shrewdly. Maybe it was a person that was a non-believer. Maybe it was by another family member. Maybe it was by an employer. Maybe it was by a neighbor. But man, Brian, I can relate to that because there's been times in my life that I've gone through difficulties in which I was treated in a way that I certainly did not deserve to be treated. We find here that the Israelites were afflicted with heavy burdens. Can anybody relate to that? You ever had a burden in your life that you felt like you just couldn't carry? It was like, God, come on, please get this off of my back. I cannot carry this burden any longer. Such were the Israelites. They were oppressed. They were fully enslaved. Once again, some of us may hear be here this morning and say, man, Brian, I feel oppressed. <laughs> Maybe the oppression you feel today is not by people. Maybe it's by temptations that you're wrestling with now. 
Maybe it's by, by internal struggles in your life and you feel like life is a constant battle, that you're in bondage, that you were enslaved by something. Well, the simple truth is this. You and I, even as children of God, will often find ourselves in difficult situations. There might even be times that we feel abandoned by God. There might be times that we feel as if God has forgotten us. He's nowhere to be found. He's not answering our prayers. He's left us alone. We are all by ourselves. You ever felt that way? Don't raise your hand. You ever felt that way? There's been times that I've felt that way. That's the way the Israelites felt. Jumping to Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for a rescue from slavery came up to God, and he heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Isaac and with Jacob and with Abraham. And God saw the people of Israel. <coughs> Excuse me, I want you to see this phrase. And God knew. That's such a powerful phrase. He, here are God's people in Israel suffering, feeling as if they had been abandoned by God, crying out to God, God, where are you? God, do you know what we're going through? And the text tells us that God not only heard their cries, but that God knew. I, I, I want to pull three simple points from that passage that we can apply to our lives today as we realize that our God is a redeeming God who desires to rescue us. If you have your outline, I simply wrote this point, God knows. God knows. <coughs> God was not ignorant to what the Israelites were going through. God was not unconcerned. God was not disconnected. He was very much aware of what his people were suffering. We, we define that ability of God to know everything that is going on as God's divine omniscience. God's perfect knowledge is seen throughout the Bible. Let me give you just a couple of examples. I give you three passages in your outline. We've already alluded to Joseph. The end of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 45 and verse 7, remember Joseph's brothers had sold him into slavery, and years down the line, Joseph now finds himself as second in command over all of Egypt. There's a famine throughout all the Middle East, and people are coming to Egypt for bread, and, and guess who shows up at Joseph's feet asking for bread? Joseph's brothers. The same ones who had sold him into slavery now come asking him for help, except they didn't know it was him. And you can read the entire story in the latter part of Genesis, but when the brothers finally realize that this king, this leader in front of them, who has the right to imprison them, kill them, is their own brother who they sold into slavery, they're absolutely scared to death. And they beg for their lives. <coughs> Joseph makes this great statement in Genesis 45, 5. He said, God sent me before you to preserve your life. What does that indicate for us? God knew exactly what they were going to go through in the years ahead. And God used, yes, difficult situations to what? To prepare them for what he had for them in the future. So the entire time that Joseph was a slave, the entire time that Joseph was in prison, God wasn't disconnected. God wasn't, you know, um, you know, disinterested. He wasn't not paying attention. No, God was there working all along. In his omniscience, God had a plan. Here's some great verses in Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4. David says this, 
O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is in my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. Hey, hey, listen, here's what David says. God knows everything about you. God knows what you're thinking right now. <coughs> God knows the very next word that's going to come out of your mouth. As a matter of fact, do me a favor. Turn to the person next to you and just say something. Turn to the person next to you and say something. All right, now listen, if you said, if you said, I hope Brian gets done quickly, that's not the correct thing to say. But God knew what you were going to say before you ever said it. That's what David says. He knows the words <coughs> that are going to come out of your tongue before you ever speak them. I love this one in Matthew chapter 10, in verse 30, he says this, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, for some of us, that's quite a job. For some of us, that doesn't take very long at all, right? But it doesn't matter whether you have a lot of hair or whether you have a small amount of hair. God knows exactly how much you have. Here's the point, church. God knows. As a redeemer, as the deliverer, as the savior, God knows. Knows. Let me give you two applications. The first is a theological application. A theological application is this. God has foreknowledge. He knows what the future holds for individuals and nations. God has foreknowledge. God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. God knows what's going to happen next week. God knows what's going to happen next month. God is never caught by surprise. Why? Because God has foreknowledge. God knows everything. There's a personal application as well. The personal application is this. God not only has foreknowledge, but God has foresight. God knows what is going on in your life. God knows what is going to happen in your life. God has foreknowledge. God has foresight. <coughs> I take great umbrage to open theists in this day and age who promote the idea that God does not know the future, who promote the idea that God is reactive to the things that take place, that God is not proactive. I do not find that in Scripture. God is completely proactive. God knows everything that is going to take place. I am offended. Excuse my directness. I am offended by prosperity preachers in this day and age who teach that God is subject to our desires. God doesn't know what's going to happen in our life until we tell him what's going to happen in our life. And once we tell God what direction we want to go, then God acts. I'm offended by that because that is not what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that God is an omniscient, all-knowing God who has foreknowledge, who has foresight, who is never caught by surprise. God knows not only what we're going through, but God knows what we are going to go through in the future. In Psalm 139, David said this, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. What is David saying? That God marked out all of our days before they happen. God marked out all of the events of our life before they take place. The great thing is, I don't know what's in the future, but God knows what's in the future. And God is already there in the future waiting for every trial and every struggle and every difficulty that I am going to go through. I will never be alone. Why is that? Because God knows. Be fully aware of the fact that your pain, your suffering, your trials are known by God. 
He knows your triumphs as well as your tragedies. And we can take comfort in the fact that our Redeemer knows. There's a second thing that he says there in Exodus. It says that God only knows, but God hears. God hears. Verse 24, it says, God heard their groaning. Have you ever sat back and thought that God's not listening to me? <laughs> uh, I mean, my prayers are kind of bouncing off the ceiling. God, God, God cannot be listening to me. God, are you listening? I mean, have you ever said that? There's been times in my prayer life, I'm like, hey, 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 God, are you awake? Are, are you listening to me? I'm praying for the same thing over and over and over and over again. That's uh, Vicky's not here this morning, by the way. She's not missing church. Uh, our, she called me at 9 o'clock and said, Brian, our van won't start. And so, um, so she's not here, so I can talk about her, so she's not here. And so we have, we, have a, we have that conversation in our house all the time. She'll be saying something, and, you know, my mind's on about 12 different things, and, and I'll hear this question about five times a day. Are you listening to me? <laughs> Wives, you ever say that to your husbands? You ever say that to your husbands? Are you listening to me? And I'm like, Vicki, I can do six things at one time, you know? And then she'll say, well, repeat to me what I just said. And I, I've already got that figured out because I'm already thinking what she just said. And so I'm able to repeat it back to her. And I'm like, yes, I'm listening, Vicki. Well, there's times that we think as if God is not listening, as if he does not hear. The Israelites thought that. After they'd been in bondage for months and years and, and their cries had gone up to God, no doubt they were wondering, God, have you forgotten us? Are we not your chosen people? Are we not the apple of your eye? God, hear us. And Exodus chapter 2 said that God heard their groaning. It is generally during our most difficult times in which we feel like our prayers are going nowhere and as if no one is listening. Yet we see in our text that God not only knows, he hears. Here are two other verses. Psalm 34 and verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears towards their cry. Psalm 66 and verse 19. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Now, now catch this today, just because God hears doesn't mean that we get everything that we pray for. You see, God, let me kind of take a detail for a second, because God will hear your prayer and answer your prayer and mine in one of three ways. God in his graciousness often answers our prayer with a yes. God, God, this is what I need. Would you grant it? Yes. How many of us can remember times in our life when we prayed that God would do something or God would give us something and God gave us exactly what we prayed for? Have you ever experienced that in your life? I mean, whether it was a financial need, whether it was a physical need, whether it was a relationship need, you prayed and boom, here's God to the rescue answering your prayer. Oh God, I have a financial need. Can you please in your graciousness provide it? And God miraculously provides it. Or God, man, I'm, I'm sick. God, would you come alongside of me and give me strength to go through? And God answers our prayer. He answers yes. But God doesn't always answer yes. As a loving father, God sometimes answers no. There's times in our life when we ask for something and we pray for something and God says, no, that, that's not in your best interests. Parents, do you understand that? Uh, what would you say if your five-year-old came to you one day and said, okay, mom, I'd like to change the menu, all right? I'm asking you to change the menu. From now on, I would like to eat ice cream and cake every morning for breakfast. And so if you would have ice cream, I'll come downstairs, I'll be ready for school, have a bowl of ice cream and a great big piece of cake right there for breakfast. Would you do that for me? How would you respond, moms? No, why? Because that's not the best thing for your child. They might be asking for it, but just because they're asking for it doesn't mean that it's beneficial, it's convenient to them. They're what? They're children. They don't always understand what's best for them. Well, listen, we're children. And at times, we have a tendency to ask for things that in our immature mind, we think, oh, that's good. That's what I need. 
If God would only give that to me, that would help me in my spiritual life. And God's like, no, that wouldn't help you. That wouldn't help you. I know you want it, but that wouldn't help you. And God, in his grace, doesn't answer yes, but God answers no. There's also times that God answers, wait, wait. Not a bad request, but the timing is just not right. I, I, I'll be honest, church, I, I am so grateful in my life and ministry that God has not answered all of my prayers the way I wanted them to be answered. Because I've prayed for some pretty dumb things in my life. I won't even tell you some of the dumbest things that I've prayed for. I've prayed for some pretty dumb things in my life. And if God would have answered those prayers, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't be experiencing what I am today. So God, in his grace, didn't what? He heard my prayer, but he didn't answer it. Or at times, he answered it in his time. I was just in Mexico City, and, and, and I remember after we'd been at at the church that we were starting for two years. Our church was growing, it was exploding, and we were needing, we were running a facility, and we needed our own property, and, and, and we found this piece of property that we thought was the perfect property. It wasn't real big, it was about 100 square meters, if you know that, and we thought, boy, this would be the perfect piece of property, and man, we were praying, we were fasting, we were begging God, we thought, this is it. We went to our home church back in Ohio, and we asked them to help, and we're like, man, God is all over this. Yes. We can't wait for God to say yes. When all of a sudden God's answer came back, and guess what God's answer was? No. I'll be honest here. I was a pastor. I was devastated. I was hurt. I was hurt by our church that had refused us, and I'm going to be honest. I was hurt by God. And I'm like, God, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. And yet God in his sovereign timing knew that that wasn't the best for us. And two years later, God provided us an unbelievable piece of property. And I wish you could see how beautiful the church is there in Mexico City today. You, you know what? If God would have answered my first prayer request, I would have never gotten the second request. If God would have given what I wanted, I would have never gotten what God wanted. You see, at times, because God doesn't answer when or how we want, we have a tendency to think, God, you're not hearing me. Where is my redeemer? Where is my liberator? And God's like, I hear you. I'm listening. Wait. I have what's best for you. That's what took place with the nation of Israel. Let me show you a, a third thing, and, and, and I know I'm taking a lot of time on this, but it's important. God not only knows, God not only hears, but God intervenes. God intervenes. This, is the, this story in the book of Exodus is such a spectacular story. You say, Brian, how do you know that? Because Hollywood keeps making movies of it. All right. I mean, whenever Hollywood takes a story from the Bible and makes a movie, you know that's a pretty great story, eh? And you can't get away from the great story here in Exodus chapter 2. Here's what happens. I'll give you a summary, and then we'll, we'll tell it real quick. God used Moses to deliver the Israelites from Egyptian bondage. Here's what happens in about 30 seconds, or maybe a little bit longer. God appears to Moses in a burning bush. You know the story? Mar Moses sees this bush that's burning, but it's not being consumed. And so Moses, out of his curiosity, goes and looks at the bush, and God yells out from the bush, take off your shoes! You're standing on holy ground. And out of the bush, God calls Moses to be Israel's leader. You know Moses' response because it's so much like my response. God, I can't do that. I, 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 I stutter, God. And God said, but I don't. God, I can't do that. I'm, I'm weak and I'm fragile. God says, I'm all powerful. God says, I've called you to be the leader. And Moses steps up under God's power and when, with Aaron's help goes and presents himself to Pharaoh and tells Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. And Pharaoh, assuming, if you know anything about Egyptian history, the Pharaoh considered himself to be God and thought, who is this God that is telling me who is God to let the Israelites go? And Pharaoh hardened his heart. 
And the great battle between God and Pharaoh plays out throughout the entire book of Exodus. You know the story. Um, First of all, all of the water turns to blood in the land of Egypt. Could you imagine? I mean, we live in a land of water down here. Could you imagine if all of the canals, all of the rivers, you know, the one that's in your backyard, the one that goes right down your street, if all of a sudden, boom, we left church and everything was blood. No fresh water whatsoever. Everything was blood. That's what took place in the land of Egypt. Then there were frogs. Frogs everywhere. You open up the cupboard and out jumps a frog. You open up your refrigerator. Honey, what do you want for lunch? Frog legs, I guess, huh? I mean, there were frogs everywhere. There's frogs in your bed. There there are frogs in your shower everywhere. A plague of frogs. After frogs, you have gnats. After gnats comes, the Bible says, every type of fly. I hate flies. Every type of fly, the Bible says. Then all the livestock begin to die. After the livestock begin to die, all of the Egyptians break out with boils. After each one of these experiences, Pharaoh, instead of softening his heart and letting the children of Israel go, he hardened his heart even more. Then hail comes and destroys half the city. Then locusts. And then it just stops being day. All of a sudden it says it just became night all of the time. Whether the sun shined or whether the sun didn't come up, it didn't matter because it was darkness all over the land. Pitch black. No sunlight whatsoever. You know the story. Finally, God institutes the Passover. The Israelites are instructed to kill a perfect lamb and to spread its blood over the doorposts of their house. By the way, a beautiful picture of what Jesus Christ would do for us in the future through his death. Because that night, the the death angel was coming through the land to kill the firstborn of every family in Egypt unless there was blood on the door. That's exactly what God did. The death wail rang out throughout Egypt as the firstborn in every family was killed. Pharaoh finally relents and lets Israel go. But shortly thereafter, once again, he hardens his heart and chases after the Israelites until God parts the waters of the Red Sea. What a fantastic story. You've seen Charlton Heston there beside the waters. You know, you've seen that. You know, Charlton Heston, the waters part. The Israelites walk across on dry land. Here comes Pharaoh's army right into the water, and God releases the water until all of Pharaoh's army is destroyed. And what does God do? He liberates his people. He delivers his people from their enemies. Now you may be here today and say, okay, Brian, I get it. God did that for Israel, but God hasn't done that for me. I've never seen water turn to blood. (laughs) I've never, I've never had waters parted so that I might miraculously walk through them. Where is God's intervention in my life? If God knows and God hears, how come God doesn't intervene in my life? Oh, my friend, I guarantee you, he's intervened in your life. At times, our our ears are closed, our eyes are shut, and we fail to see God's intervention, God's gracious work of being a redeemer in our lives. I could stand here today and tell you story after story of how God graciously intervened in my life. As a teenager, I started to make some bad decisions. Even though I was raised in a Christian home, I started to make some bad decisions. Started to head down the wrong road until God brought this godly lady in my life named Vicki Pearson. And my life has never been the same. God showed up. God intervened. At 36, I I had my first heart attack and survived. And even though several other family members in our family died at the age of 32 and 37, God miraculously, for some reason, intervened in my life and spared my life, not because anything I've done or because my heart is a lot stronger than my Uncle Bob's heart was. It was God. It was God who showed up in my life and intervened. 
I was a, as a young preacher, I wanted so badly to go to New England and, and start a church. But God intervened in our life and sent us the complete opposite direction. New England is this way. He sent us to Mexico, kind of like a, 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 a Jonah experience. He said, no, here's the plan that I have for you. And what a blessing this last weekend to be able to experience the blessing of God's intervention in my life. Ten years ago, God intervened in our life and brought us to South Florida. We couldn't figure out why until God brought us to Hollywood Community Church. God intervened in our life. It's so funny, I tell people all the time, when I was a senior in college, I was a senior in college, I'm from Canton, Ohio, didn't know anything about Florida. I was a senior in college, God brought two freshmen into my room who became my roommates my senior year in college. Their names were Steve and Craig Tuck. Some of you might know them. Steve and Craig Tuck were from this church called First Baptist Church of West Hollywood. I had no idea what it was. They told me all about how great their church was, First Baptist Church of West Hollywood. How would I know 30 years later that I have the opportunity, the privilege, to pastor the same church as my roommates when I was a senior in college? God intervenes. God intervenes in our lives. Why is that? Because God's character, his, his personality is to deliver. It's to redeem. It's to do what is best for us. We see that in the Old Testament. Let me ask you today, would you think for just a second, how has God intervened in your life? That'd be a great lunchtime conversation today. How has God intervened in your life? Take off the blinders. Take out the earplugs. Listen, hear, see what God is doing in your life. He desires to be your redeemer. Let me show you the second thing. My time is almost up. In the Old Testament, God liberated his people from their enemies. And back to Matthew chapter 1, we see that in Jesus, God redeems his people from their sins. In Jesus, God redeems his people from their sins. Once again, Matthew 121, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. A couple of points, let me give you quickly. First of all this, the name Jesus means Jehovah or Yahweh saves. Remember the angel was very specific. And by the way, there's only about eight to 10 people. I think there's eight people in all of scripture that were named before they were born. And each of them lived up to their names. And so the angel comes to Joseph, and by the way, he tells Mary the exact same thing in Luke chapter 1 and verse 31. He says, his name shall be called Jesus, which means Jehovah is salvation. If you take the word from the Hebrew, the Hebrew word is Yehoshua, which means Joshua. Yes, the name Joshua in the Old Testament is the same as Jesus in the New Testament. Joshua comes from the Hebrew. Jesus comes from the Greek. The Greek word is pronounced Iesus. Jesus is the human name of Jesus as the incarnate, eternal Son of God. As I said in the beginning of the message, even his name cries out his eternal purpose. His name means Jehovah is salvation. The second thing that I wrote in your notes is this. The mission of Jesus was not just to save people from Roman oppression, but the mission of Jesus was to save people from their own transgressions. Now remember Moses in the Old Testament, he came and he delivered people from, he delivered the Israelites from the Egyptian oppression. And as Jesus showed up on the scene, that's what everybody expected him to do. Jesus, establish your kingdom. Get rid of those wicked Romans. Free us. Liberate us. But Jesus' plan was much more profound than that. Because Jesus didn't come just to liberate the Jews from the Romans. He came to liberate all of us from our own transgressions. You see, a human at times can free us from the difficulties of this life. Only God can free us from the source of the difficulties of this life. And the source of the difficulties of this life is what? It's sin. 
I mean, look at everything that's happened around us. This has been a tragic week in our country. If you're like me, I'm still broken for the people of San Bernardino, California. I'm still broken for the suffering. And we sit back and think, why, how can all of this be taking place? And the the simple truth is this. We live in a world that is controlled by sin. And the things that you and I see played out each and every day on a global, a national, and even a personal way in our lives is the result of sin. So if Jesus simply came saying, hey, I came to free you from your difficulties. What's the problem that you have in your life? Do you have an Egyptian that's bothering you? Or do you have a boss that's the, that is causing you problems? Or is your spouse your biggest enemy? Let me free you from that problem. That would be a temporary solution. But Jesus didn't come to offer temporary solutions. He said, I came to redeem them from what? From their sin from their own sins, which is the source of our problems. We've said today that God is redemptive. God is a redeemer. In the very beginning, we described a redeemer not only as the one who liberates, but but as one who is willing to pay the price so that another person might be free. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. Illustrated by the sacrificial lamb in Exodus chapter two, played out by Jesus. As he came and presented himself as the lamb without spot and blemish and gave his life to pay for, to free us from our sins. And so as we look at the Christmas story this year, we must be reminded of why Jesus came. Jesus simply said this, oh, I've come to seek and to save those who are lost. I've come to give my life as a ransom for many. I came not just to deliver from problems. I came to redeem from sin. I came to pay the price. You're a slave in the marketplace of sin. And Jesus said, I went to the slave market and I found you living in your sins and I pay the price so that you might be freed, so that you might be redeemed. God is redemptive. God is redemptive as seen through the person of Jesus. The story of Christmas is the story of redemption. Our redemptive God saw us oppressed, enslaved, and tormented by our sins. So he decided to rescue us, to liberate us from our sins. That's why Jesus came. He came to die so that we might live. So so here's the question as we end today. Have you been redeemed? I'm not asking this morning if you come to church. You're here today. I know you come to church That's great. Have you been redeemed? Has your life been rescued from the penalty, from the power, and from the consequences of sin? You see, if there's never been a time in your life, it doesn't matter how many times you attend Hollywood Community Church, it doesn't matter how much you give, it doesn't matter how much you serve, if there's never been a time in your life when you realize, oh God, I'm a sinner, I desperately need you and I repent of my sins, and I cry out to you, and I ask you to be my redeemer and my savior. There's never been a time in your life when you've done that. God desires to redeem you. And if there has been a time, are you living under the consequences of your sin when God desires to free you from it? Run to the redeemer today. 